I'm Ryan Anderson. I'm the president of the Ethics and Public Policy Center, and I'm the author of a couple of books on questions of natural law theory and public policy. Today, I want to spend a few moments with you uh, thinking about how Catholics should view our vocation as citizens. There really shouldn't be any tension in how we approach our civic life, both as Americans and as Catholics. These things can be harmonious. So, so let me start with a flawed way of thinking about this. And the flawed way of thinking about this comes from a Catholic president, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, a speech that he gave in 1960 to the Greater Houston Ministerial Association, l- largely an audience of Protestant pastors. And he's trying to convince a bunch of Protestants that they have nothing to fear from a Catholic. At one point, he says that he believes in a separation of church and state that's absolute. At another point, he says he thinks that someone's uh, religious belief should be their own private affair. I want to argue that more or less everything that Kennedy says in that speech, with, with a couple exceptions, gets it wrong, not simply from a Catholic perspective, but from an American perspective. Viewing the separation of church and state as if it's a separation of religion from politics or a separation of morality from law gets it entirely wrong. Uh, What the American founders thought they were doing and and what the Constitution requires is that all competing ideological, philosophical, theological uh, traditions and viewpoints have an equal seat at the table. It would be discriminatory. It would be unjust. It would be unconstitutional if you said, oh, the Southern Baptists have a seat at the table, but not the Catholics. Or the Christians have a seat at the table, but not the Jews. Or secular citizens have a seat at the table, but not religious citizens, right? You you could have the religious discrimination going on a variety of ways. It could be Protestants v. Catholics. It could be Christians v. non-Christians. It could be religious people v. non-religious. Or more increasingly in our own time period, it's non-religious v. religious. The end result is what my former boss, Father Richard John Newhouse, uh, referred to as the naked public square. The idea that the institutional separation, the institution of church, the institution of state, meant a functional denuding of the public square of any of the theological, philosophical, moral traditions, the sources of our rationality for thinking about justice, the common good, rights, et cetera, et cetera, that they're all excluded. It's to say that while there are different institutions of the church and of the state, and they have different jurisdiction, the jurisdiction of the bishop is different than the jurisdiction of the governor, right? The jurisdiction of uh, the things that belong to Caesar and the jurisdiction of the things that belong to God, those are different jurisdictions, different institutions. So there is, at a certain level, a separation of church and state. There's not a separation of religion from public life. There's not a separation of morality from law. All of us have deep metaphysical commitments, whether we know it or not. And our metaphysical commitments of necessity influence our moral commitments. And then our moral commitments influence our political commitments. Now, it's awfully odd for the certain type of Rawlsian who wants to say that all of the secular metaphysical and moral commitments can influence politics, but none of the theological, none of the religious, metaphysical or moral commitments can. I just think that's, it's not in keeping with the American tradition. It's unconstitutional because it discriminates against um, uh, citizens based upon their religious beliefs. And it's certainly not what America at her best did. America at her best said that our metaphysical viewpoints should influence our moral viewpoints. Our moral viewpoints should influence our political viewpoints. And and the best example of this is someone like Martin Luther King Jr. The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. allowed his Christian commitments about the equality of all men, the equality of all people, the brotherhood of men, as he referred to it, under the fatherhood of God. And the civil rights movement is one of the crowning achievements of Christian ethics brought, brought to bear in the public square to change unjust laws and to rectify them with just laws. Who does Martin Luther King Jr. cite in his letter from the Birmingham jail? He cites two Catholic saints. He cites Saints Augustine and Saint Thomas Aquinas. First, he says, citing Augustine, an unjust law is no law at all. Second, he cites Saint Thomas Aquinas. How do we know the difference between a just law and an unjust law? A just law is a man-made code that's in harmony with the natural law and the eternal law. This is how, from an American perspective, People of faith, uh, including Catholics, can bring our faith into public life. Um, We're not violating any norm of the separation of church and state, a phrase, again, that doesn't actually appear in the Constitution. 
um, doesn't violate religious liberty. If anything, it would be a violation of religious liberty to say that religious citizens can't draw from the fullness of their beliefs as they contemplate questions of right and wrong, justice and injustice, the common good, human rights, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so, so let me now pivot. And I, I've been speaking about how we should think about this from an American perspective. Let me now say more about how we should think about this from a Catholic perspective. Because it's not just that JFK got it wrong from a constitutional and an American political tradition perspective. He also got his own faith wrong. Uh, JFK says, I believe in a president whose religious beliefs are his own private affair. Our faith is personal, but it should never be private. It's a public faith. These are public truth claims. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not a private truth. It's a public truth. It's a public revealed truth. And so the vocation of all Christians is to transform temporal reality in light of the gospel. And it's the vocation of all Christians to do this in keeping with your station in life. So it's the vocation of the clergy, the vocation of, of the bishop, the priests who are assisting the bishop to teach, govern, and sanctify the church, right? The teach, govern, sanctify. It's not for the state or the city or the nation, right? That office, that charism, teach, govern, sanctify is for the church, for the clergy, but for the laity, for people like you and me, we're to transform all of temporal reality in light of the gospel in keeping with the proper mission. So if I'm running a business, I want to run my business in a way that is in keeping with Christian ethics. If I'm running a school, if I'm running a hospital, if I'm running a, a charity, if I'm running a polity, all of us are running polities as citizens in a self-governing uh, Republican democracy. Right? Each and every one of us, you know, every two years on an, an election day in November, uh, every two days during the primary season, sometime in the spring, like we participate in a self-governing process. And, and that means we're supposed to be transforming political institutions in light of the gospel. That doesn't mean this is what sometimes we get accused of. Oh, so what you want to collapse the separation of church and say, you want a theocracy, you want the priests and the bishops ruling um, the state. It's not what I'm saying at all. But what I am saying is that we should draw from the deepest truths about human nature about human origins, human destiny, about morality, truths that are revealed by our faith, truths that are knowable by the natural law, when we're thinking about right and wrong, justice and injustice, human rights, the common good. Let me now unpack this a little bit more. I, I want to go through three different ways, um, especially during an election season, but this is really going to be true um, regardless of what time of year it is. As we think about what our vocation is, as citizens and as Catholic citizens. And the first thing I wanna suggest is that it should transform how we engage in the political process. Too many people always are saying this election is the most important election in their lifetime. And it's all, the next election will be even more important than this election. And it can make people think that elections are the ultimate reality. For a Christian, at best, they are a penultimate reality. And so this should help us keep perspective. Politics are important, but they're not the most important thing. It strikes me that many people today, especially in the United States, politics has become their religion. And they treat politics as the most important thing. And, and they, and they you know, cut off friendships, it divides families based upon political uh, allegiances, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the way that a Catholic should approach this is by putting politics in a, an appropriate uh, box. It's important, but it's not the most important. Second thing to say about how we engage in politics is that uh, we should have a spirit of charity. We should have a spirit of charity in everything that we do, right? As Christians, the, the love of Christ should uh, compel us in all that we do, including in our political engagement. And so the way in which we engage in politics should be that of a happy warrior, right? We shouldn't be the people who are always naysayers, the mudslingers, uh, people who are always using the hyperbole, et cetera, et cetera. We, we should be realistic about the challenges that confront us. We have very serious challenges in the United States today. Um, elections do hinge on right and wrong, good and evil. There, there really is um, evil that needs to be combated by law, by public policy. There really are things that are good that need to be supported by law and public policy. N none of this is suggest that somehow politics doesn't matter. It is to suggest that we should put it in its right um, horizon and that we should engage in the political process as Christians. It's not as if um, it, many people have heard the, the faith and work movement. You know, we can't leave our faith 
at home Monday through Friday, nine to five. You know, we should bring our faith into the workplace. Something similar would be true when it comes to political realities. It's not as if we could say, oh, well, I'm leaving my faith at home when I engage in the public square or when I go to the ballot box or when I, um, uh, when I work on Capitol Hill, et cetera, et cetera. We, we should be fully integrated every day of the week, 24 hours a day, whether it's with our families, our jobs, or in our responsibility as citizens. So that's part one. Uh, part two, uh, the deepest thing that the Catholic faith gives us that has political relevance is a certain vision of the human person. It's a certain vision of what human flourishing looks like. And, and to my mind, that's actually what's unique about our moment in time in the United States is that those are what our deepest disagreements are about. Um, the, 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 the other time that you could see this was the debate over slavery whether or not the truth that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, which is, you know, Thomas Jefferson's way of saying that the Imago Dei is real and true and has political implications, whether or not that was going to apply um, to people with a darker skin color, whether or not skin color was somehow a decisive factor for who was made in the image and likeness of God, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and who wasn't. Today, we have um, similar anthropological uh, disagreements about the unborn child in the womb, about being created male and female, about men and women being created for each other in marriage, about all of us being created for relationship with God. Think about all the religious liberty debates. We, we have two different anthropologies on offer. Um, there's a Christian, historic Christian, Judeo-Christian anthropology, and then, and then there's what a variety of scholars have called expressive individualism, right? Where each and every one of us has an inner truth and the purpose of life is to give expression to our inner truth. By contrast, uh, and this is true not just um, for Catholicism, but, but you know, for the American founding, they would have said, look, there's actually God's truth. God's truths are knowable by reason and by faith. And the purpose of life is to live in accordance with God's laws, right? And so you can see these two different anthropologies. How has this played out historically? Tom Holland, uh, maybe five years ago, wrote a doorstopper of a book. You know, it's like an 800, 900 page book called Dominion. And it's a history of all of Christianity. He describes the transformation um, from the Greco-Roman world, the you know, world of classical antiquity into the early Christian world. And what took place was a revolution, the Christian revolution when it came to thinking about human dignity. You look at how Christians um, uh, treated all human beings in vastly different ways when it came to slavery, when it came to the status of women, when it came to the status of the poor, when it came to the status of people who had disabilities or who were infirm. People who in Greco-Roman culture were more or less um, uh, subhuman in a variety of ways, all of a sudden were precious children of God. One is how do we engage in politics as Christians? Second, what is our vision of human nature, of human dignity, of human flourishing, and then of the moral norms, right? The natural law, um, the law of God, what Martin Luther King Jr. was appealing to in the Birmingham jail to say that these segregation laws were unjust because they were a man-made law that was not in harmony with the natural and the eternal law. So, so that's the second thing. Um, that there's a substantive vision of human nature that we can bring to the table. The, the third area that um, about how as Catholics that I want to highlight this should bear is there are particular moral questions um, where we cannot support certain policies and therefore we cannot support certain politicians who are advancing those policies precisely because they are contrary to human dignity, to human nature, to human flourishing, and to the natural law. So I'm gonna date myself, but when I was an undergraduate, there was a group that put out a voter's guide and they described what they called the five non-negotiable issues for Catholics. And it was abortion, euthanasia, cloning, embryo destructive stem cell research, and same-sex marriage. I, I never liked that phrasing of non-negotiable because it made it seem like, well, everything else in Catholic morality is negotiable. You can negotiate with the rest of it, but only these five issues are non-negotiable. Um, but what they were getting at is that these were five issues that are intrinsically evil, and therefore no Catholic could support them. All five of these things 
um, intrinsically, inherently go against the human good. Um, they attack human nature and human dignity. And therefore, you as a citizen, you could not support these things. If there was a ballot initiative, you couldn't vote in favor of um, a right to protect uh, uh, abortion. You couldn't vote in favor of redefining what the nature of marriage is. You couldn't vote in favor of funding for embryo destructive stem cell research. You couldn't vote in favor of um, allowing assisted suicide or euthanasia. That's what they were getting at. And the reason why you couldn't vote in favor of these things as a political matter is that as a moral matter, these things cut against the natural law because they attack the human person and the human person's dignity. Now, it's not just these five. You know, I'm dating myself because, you know, several of these things are no longer alive issues. We, we don't even talk anymore about cloning or embryo destructive research. The same-sex marriage debate is now a decade behind us. Obviously, abortion and euthanasia are still um, vitally important. Uh, the Catholic bishops have said that, you know, abortion is the preeminent moral, cultural, political issue of our day. It's the human rights issue of our generation. But it's not just these five that are intrinsically evil. Um, you, you could also think of things like torture, targeting non-combatants in war, um, how we treat uh, or possibly exploit migrants, et cetera, et cetera. There, there are a variety of other things that are intrinsically wrong and that might have political uh, salience. So how should we um, think about these in contrast to other issues? I think healthcare is really important. I think our immigration debates are really important. Two things to say here, there is no one uniquely correct Catholic answer to our healthcare problems or to our immigration problem. You can't open the catechism and find out, well, what's the answer to healthcare reform or to immigration reform? Uh, Catholics of goodwill and of sound formation, sound intellect, sound theology, will have a variety of reasonable disagreements about, right, should we have a more market-based healthcare system? Should we have a more single-payer system? Should we have healthcare vouchers? Should we have a variety of you know, government supports? Yes or no? What are the pros? What are the cons? And we're going to have to debate those things on the merits, right? But now here would be a contrast. Should we have government funding of abortion? Should we even have abortion? Right there, there's not as if there's a good faith Catholic disagreement. No Catholic in good faith could support government funding of abortion. No Catholic in good faith could support legalized abortion. And so that's the, the contrast that I want to draw. There, there are certain things that are prudential questions. How do we reform healthcare in America to ensure that all Americans have access to affordable, quality health care? That goal needs to be the goal. Right? All of us should say that we want to live in a society in which every American has access to affordable and quality health care. How do we get there? You need expertise that go beyond the faith. You need economic expertise. You need policy wonkery expertise. You need medical expertise. You need insurance, actuarial tables. A whole host of secular disciplines need to come to bear. But we do know that we couldn't um, support certain things as if they were healthcare, sex reassignment procedures, right? That wasn't one of the things that was on the five non-negotiables from you know now 20 years ago, but that's a non-negotiable. And what I mean by that is that's something that's intrinsically evil to, to try to turn a little boy into a girl or to try to turn a little girl into a boy, puberty blocking drugs, cross sex hormones, double mastectomies for 13 year old girls. If you're voting in favor of these things, or if you're saying as you know, part of my health uh, insurance reform package is that we're going to have cost-free coverage of sex change procedures for minors. Right? The Catholic faith does have something not just prudentially to say about that, but in principle. Right? This is something that's intrinsically contrary to human nature, to human dignity, to human flourishing. All right, so, so let me take a step back um, and say a little bit of what does this mean when it actually comes time to vote? None of us can support someone precisely because of the unjust policies that he or she supports. I cannot say I'm voting for candidate X because he promised he's gonna torture the terrorists. I'm voting for candidate Y because he's promised that he's gonna engage in terror bombing, targeting innocent civilians in order to get the political leaders of the opposing country to surrender. 
right? We would all recognize that we couldn't support someone precisely because they're going to engage in war crimes. The corollary of this for domestic policy was that I cannot support someone precisely because they're going to protect a so-called right to choose abortion. I can't vote for someone precisely because they're going to allow physician-assisted suicide. They're going to allow sex change procedures for minors, right? I can't vote for someone if that's the reason why I'm doing it. This is in the Catholic moral theology language. This is formal cooperation with evil because my intention is to share in their intention with an evil end. It's an easier question if then the other candidate is against all of those things, right? So, so you know, it, the example I just gave uh, was about war crimes. It was about abortion, assisted suicide, sex reassignment procedures. If the other candidate is saying, well, look, I'm only going to engage in just warfare using justified means. I'm going to be protecting unborn babies, protecting their mo mothers. I'm not going to be doing, um, uh, I'm not going to be allowing sex reassignment procedures for minors, and I'm not going to be expanding assisted suicide. That would be an easier choice. But what if you have a situation in which neither candidate is ideal? This is where there's a, a, a very important paragraph from Evangelium Vitae, the Gospel of Life. It's a, a paragraph 73, and then it continues in 74. Uh, and then Cardinal Ratzinger, back when he was the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, he cites this in, in, in his doctrinal note on the political obligations of Catholics. And he says, look, if you can't um, protect all of the good that you seek, you should at least seek to minimize as much of the evil as you can. And he said, this is a question that confronts Catholics in Parliament or Catholics in Congress, where you have a vote, and it's not going to be a abolition of abortion. It may be a 20-week bill, a 15-week bill, an eight-week bill. But the alternative, if that bill doesn't pass, is abortion on demand. And what John Paul II and Cardinal Ratzinger said is that the way that you should think about this is that you're not voting to protect abortion for eight weeks. You're voting to protect babies for 32 weeks. You would prefer to protect babies for all 40 weeks. Given current political realities, you can't. They point out that there's some requirements here. You, you're, you need to make clear your opposition to all abortion, right? So, so they say that you know so a Catholic whose opposition to the evil at stake is well known and well articulated could vote for what in essence would be the lesser of two evils, right? An eight week bill is less evil than a 40 week abortion on demand bill. The ideal would still be that we protect all unborn babies. I think many of us are gonna have to apply that principle to our political choices, not just in this election, but in you know elections to come. Um, I'm not using names or even a time period precisely because I want the principles that I'm appealing to to be evergreen. Um, these are things that are gonna be the case regardless of which parties are at stake, who the office holders are. Um, and then the very last thing I'll say is that character matters. You know, I said that there was, how do we engage in politics? What's our vision of the human person? And then what are particular moral questions? All three of those things matter when we're selecting candidates. Because there are questions that are going to come during the next, let's say you're voting for a senator, the next six years, there could be new issues that we're not currently thinking of. But if you vote for someone that has the right virtues, has the right character, you vote for someone that has the right worldview, uh, the right vision of the human person, then when a new issue arises, more likely than not, this office holder will be prepared for what that new challenge is. So, you know, it was not at all surprising to me that as the transgender issue emerged seemingly out of nowhere, it was many of the political leaders who had the right virtues who had the right worldview, who had been solid on the marriage debate, who had been solid on the abortion debate, they then became the leaders for the correct side of the transgender debate. Right? And again, it wasn't because I already knew ahead of time what their position was on gender ideology questions, because that wasn't really a live issue a decade ago. But it was precisely because of the virtues that they had cultivated themselves and the worldview that they had cultivated, that as a new issue presented itself, they were ready for statementship. We want to think of the character of the person seeking office. We want to think about the worldview, the vision of the human person, the underlying moral philosophy. And then we do want to look at particular moral political questions, uh, realizing that there are certain things that we cannot support and that in a world where we have less than ideal candidates, we may have to um, pick the lesser 
of two evils, but under the guise of protecting the good and promoting the good that can be protected and promoted. Thank you. 